right now. I'm thrilled to be back with not only my esteemed guest, Steve Ray, but my dear brother and my dear friend. We've been dear brothers and friends for a long time now. In fact, back when we became friends, I, I had a little bit more hair than I have today. But I'm thrilled to be back with you, brother. Looking wonderful. Bald is beautiful. <laughs> brother, how are you been? Head because there's too much glare for the viewers. I mean, I got my bird t-shirt on today because that's love kind it. of my wife and my hobby. We love to do bird watching wherever we go in the world. And um, that's wow. why we got this big back window. So we have uh, You're going to Israel tomorrow. Yep. We're leaving for Israel tomorrow. We'll be there a month. Have you all ever bird watched over there? Oh, yeah. I've got about five or six Birds of Israel books and binoculars wow. we take with us. And I've got actually six or seven free days this time. We're going to go exploring uh, rent a car and go all over Israel exploring and do some bird watching too. I love that. That is incredible. And you are an incredibly active apologist. And that is a blessing because I have told people that there are very few people that I remember from back, back, back in the day when we first, when I first began doing this, that were going at it two, 300 miles per hour that are still relevant and going at it the same way. Well, I have to say, you're not going at it the same way. You're going probably double that speed today. You are, you're, you're really, really very active and you're writing a lot of material. You just are doing a lot of great work. We're going to talk about an incredible book that you just put out. It is a book that covers the commentary on the Bible's first book, the book of Genesis. Before I even ask you anything, what inspired you to write this book? Well, it's the most important book in the Bible. People may argue with that, but we have senses, smell, taste, seeing, hearing, touching. Everything we know about the world around us, we know from that, those five senses. And they're very inadequate to know everything. Uh -huh. God wanted us to know who he was, what was before the beginning, what he did at the beginning, why he created us, how he created us, the purpose is for it, why we have suffering in the world because something went awry and what he's doing to fix it and that there is a purpose and a meaning to life. So that the book of Genesis is the foundation for the all of the rest of scripture. It's the foundation for everything we know about ourselves as human beings as far as to where we came from. And it is also the source of our Catholic faith and our understanding of God. So Genesis is the trajectory. It's the beginning. God let me put it this way. God loves us and he wants us to know him. And so he gave us a revelation so that we would know about him and why he made us. Science can sometimes tell us the how, but it's revelation that tells us the why. Great way you put that. Now, one thing that I really enjoy, not only about your books, but about all your material, is you always bring something either new or unique or both to the table. Now, I recall when I, when I wrote my book on Mary, you put an ingenious question to me. You told me, William, there are a lot of books about Mary out there. What will make your book unique? The Catholic world needs a unique one. And I remember telling you, you said, okay, good job. That is unique. Now, when I think about all the books you've written, you put out material that is incredibly unique, very important for our times. Now, I think about the book of Genesis, and I realize that, well, you know, we've, we've got quite a few commentaries in the book out on the book of Genesis out there. What is unique about yours, and why another commentary on the book of Genesis? Well, I found out that there, in, in doing what I did, and actually it started with somebody asked me to write a Bible study on Genesis, because there uh, wasn't anything for Catholics. Right. So I wrote a kind of a simple, but a good commentary and it's in the catholic scripture study international series cool. um, and, and that's still being used all around the world as a bible study on, on genesis for catholics and i found out that there weren't any commentaries on genesis by catholics there's a lot of commentaries on genesis by protestants and right. even by jews but if you look for and say in the last 50 years anything commentary on Genesis. Now there may be some in sets like the anchor Bible set. Yeah. Some of those kind of big uh, sets of commentaries, but 
as a standalone book, I don't know if there is any, especially for Catholics. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy that I, I was able to get this out because it's going to hopefully introduce people to the Bible and to yeah. Genesis in a whole new way. No, I, it's I a totally fun read too, you. by the way. It's a fun read. People said it reads like a novel. Yeah, and I think that that really is um, the kind of way you write everything or even the kind of way you film material. We always get really fun to read material or like the incredible DVD series you put forth, incredibly fun to follow journeys that you put forth. So, you know, I'm thrilled for people to get the opportunity to read this really, really good book. And I agree with you. I know it may be a little bit controversial, but I agree that the book of Genesis is the most important book of the Bible. We've got tons of prophecies there, messianic prophecies. And we have a beautiful picture of our ancient faith right there, the roots of it right there. Now, one question people always have on their mind is, how does Genesis set the tone for the rest of the Bible? And does it set the tone in any kind of important way? Well, the word Genesis, I'll show you the copy of the book, by the way. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. And it's, uh, it's 466 pages, but it's easy to read. It's not, uh, it's not in the genre of scholarly in the sense that you get bogged down in the weeds and right. footnotes. It's, an, it's a very readable book. Um, how does this set the tone? Well, the word Genesis means beginning. In the Greek Septuagint version, it's a, it starts out with a Genesis, and that means in the beginning. And it's the beginning of a lot of things. It's the beginning of right. creation. It's the beginning of mankind. It's the beginning of life. It's the beginning of angelic beings. It's the beginning of sin and corruption in the world. It's the beginning of redemption. It's the beginning of the patriarchs. It's, yeah. and, but it also begs the question, William, if you say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, then you ask yourself, well, what was before the beginning? And so then it also gives us an understanding of what there was before the beginning of space and time, which is contained in the universe, which God created out of nothing. And before the beginning was God in a trinity. And he right. didn't need anybody. He didn't need to create anyone. In fact, he was he, the trinity is like a family. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had so much fun together, laughing. Of course they laugh. We're made in their image, and we laugh. They have a good time. They have a good sense of humor came from God. They love each other. It, they had such a good time together that it just bubbled over. They just couldn't stand it anymore in a way. And they said, we've got to create other beings in our image so that we could share all of this with them. And that's why we were created. And this is what the book of Genesis opens up and lets us know that before the beginning, there was an artist. In fact... In Romans chapter 1, I think it's verse 20, Paul says that we can know a lot about, without re revelation even, just with our, our, our mind, we can know about God by looking at what he has made, his oh. divine power, his eternal nature, and so on. We can see these things about God by what he's made. The word, the five English words, what has been, what he has made, what has been made, four words, is one Greek word, poema. The word get where we get the word poem. So God is a poet. Yeah. He's an artist. He made something. We can look at what he made, like Bach or Beethoven or you know Michelangelo, and you could see something about them by the work that they created. And we can learn something about God by what he's created. But the revelation that he gives us helps us to understand him in a much more way that we couldn't figure out with our reason. So it sets the tone for the whole rest of the Bible in the sense that it, it, it is the beginning of everything. So yeah. Exodus is based on Genesis. The Gospel of John is based on Genesis. If you read the book yeah. of Revelation, all of the imagery in Revelation yeah. comes out of the book of Genesis. So, and, and I have also the other book I, commentary I wrote. Pull that off. This one's on John, St. John's Gospel, that also Ignatius Press published. And Guess how that book begins? In the beginning. The same yep. as Genesis. Those two books both begin with in the beginning. So I think what John is telling you is if you want to understand my book that begins with in the beginning, you have to understand the first one, Genesis, that begins that way. And so really all of the other books in the Bible find their roots in Genesis. Now that really is incredible the way you broke that down. You're correct that I very often 
when I find myself either writing or preparing for a debate on whatever given topic, I always find myself right back there to the book of Genesis. You're yep. right. What a massively important book, biblical book. But that does bring me to my next question. How on earth are you able to break down the incredible content of an incredibly important book like Genesis into bite-sized pieces, if you will? Yep, I, I like to do that too because I'm I'm a simple person, really. And you do, I like, you do I like you do a great job of that. I want to be very clear. You do a great job of balancing material that people that are nerds with theology are going to love, and beginners will get a lot out of it as well. Yeah, I, I try to do that because I'm I'm not a theologian or a philosopher. I'm kind of a simple guy, actually, raised on a farm, you know. And I I look at things in simple ways, try to break it down. So people look at the Bible and it, they start with Genesis and they go, wow, this is a massive, you know, maybe I'll read it next year. And they put it back yeah. down on, this, on the... Yeah, they might be intimidated. <laughs> yeah, intimidated. Yeah. So look at, well, let's break, it, make it real simple. Eight points. You can remember everything about Genesis. Genesis is divided into two parts. The first part we can call prehistory. That is Genesis 1 through 11. And it's a time before we can assign specific dates to things like the flood. We know it happened. It's historical, but we don't know what the date was. We don't know what date Adam was created. Now, some Protestants think they know that it was 6,000 6, years ago on April 29th at noon, right. but uh, we don't know that date. that. Adam, so th that first 11 chapters, we would call maybe primordial history oh. or prehistory. And that's four parts. If you memorize these four points, you've got the whole first section of Genesis. Creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. That summarizes the first 11 chapters of Genesis. The fall, I mean creation, and then the fall. And because of the fall comes the flood, and after the flood comes the Tower of Babel. That's the first section. Now yep. we go to chapters 12 through 50, the bigger section, and we could call that patriarchal history or recorded history because with Abraham, wow. now we can start at finding dates because... There were other kingdoms and civilizations that also were writing and beginning to record history at that same right. time, about 2000 BC. That's when Abraham's roughly about 2000 BC. So now we take the second part and we can divide that into four sections. We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And all of them have about this, you know, similarly equal amount of time given to them. And they are so different. Those guys are so, I hope we have time to get into that because the uniqueness of those four men and yeah. how they related to God is just, it's a fascinating read. It's some of the most sublime literature ever written. So that's now, a, does your book cover a, a little bit about those incredible figures? Oh, uh, the whole, I <laughs> see one of the things that's fun about for me to write this, William, is I've been to all the places that Genesis mentions. I've been you to, you know them I've very well. Er, we went into the death pits, like the graves in uh, where Abraham spent the first 75 years of his life. People don't know that he worshipped Nana, the god of the moon. That was the god that they worshipped in Ur, U-R. That's how you spell yep. it, U-R. And it was on the Tigris and Euphrates River. I waded across the Euphrates River, you know, and I went up on the ziggurat. This is 4,000 years old. It's a ziggurat, like a big pyramid where... It says in the book of Joshua, your fathers, Abraham's family, they worshipped other gods. Yeah. People don't realize that Abraham and his family worshipped Nana, the god of the moon. And then God called him. So, yeah, I, I talk about all of them. Not, and I put these characters in their context, where they are, what they live like. Just a, just a little interesting tidbit. You know, we see movies about biblical characters and they all have beautiful white teeth. And they're all like, you know, straight across. Oh, yeah. But if you go out and like I've done many times out and visit the Bedouins out in the deserts of like in Israel down in the south and then the Gev Desert and outside of Bethlehem, those people only have two or three of their original teeth and the rest wow. of them are brown. They don't have dentists. They don't have toothbrushes. When a tooth gets sore or a cavity, they pull it out. So there's no reason to believe that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or other biblical characters had all their teeth and they lived rustic in, in 
were leaving for Israel tomorrow. So, and so they weren't blonde haired and blue eyed. No, and Jesus wasn't from Sweden. And when we drive through the deserts of, of the Judean wilderness and we see the Bedouins out in, there, out in the desert, I say to people, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're seeing them right out there. That's them with their flocks. That's wow. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, by the way, that's Sarah. See the girl with her black robe walking over on the ridge? That's Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel. So I've been to those places and I've been out with those people. And so when I'm writing the book, I'm bringing the context in so you could feel like you're there with Abraham and get to know him a little bit and Isaac and Jacob and where they were. Yeah. So we will, I do talk about that. And it was sad to finish the book because I, I became friends with those guys and I wanted the story to keep going. It does in Exodus, of course, but I mean, they died and that was the end of Abraham and then yeah. Isaac and then Jacob and then Joseph. But, but the writing, the story itself is sublime literature. And I tried to make it easy for people to enjoy the story. Now, here's the, one of the reasons why I say that you are one of the premier apologists in the world. You have been since I've met you. And I don't, I don't, I mean, people can watch my shows, they'll see, they're not going to come out and say, William, I mean, you tell every guest that. No, I do not. I truly do mean it. And I, I know blush. for a fact. I blush. And I mean it. And I know for a fact <laughs> you had to have done incredibly deep work reading the fathers and what they had to say about Genesis and what have you. I know you did deep work here. So I've got to pick your brain from what you know, from what you did incredible research on. Who wrote Genesis? And here's another one that very often our fellow Catholic brethren and brothers and sisters want to know. They say, well, does it even matter? So who wrote it and does it matter for us? Yep. Well, before I answer that question, I, one of the things I did in this book is I use, a, I quote and refer to Jewish rabbis and teachers throughout the book almost as much as I do Catholic commentators. Wow. Because Genesis was their book long before we came on the scene with yep. Jesus. And they were reading this book and they were studying all these things thousands years before. And so I'm always drawing from Jewish rabbis, even rabbis from before the time of Christ and during the medieval ages and the early, all through history and modern Jewish. It's, it's fascinating what they have to contribute. Now, who wrote the book? Um, according to scholars today who think that they're smarter than the ancients because they have computers. Yep. And they, they have something called JEPD. It's a, it's called, I don't want to get all in the weeds here, but documentary hypothesis it's called. And they believe that the book of Genesis and the Pentateuch, that the Pentateuch Genesis is the first of five books called the law of Moses, Genesis, yeah. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They call it the Pentateuch, which means five scrolls is what it means. Penta five Took scrolls. And they believe that different authors wrote separate documents around the fourth or fifth century BC. That's even, that's 500 years after King David. And then somebody, maybe Ezra or somebody, wove them all together into what we have today as the books of Moses. And nobody has ever believed that through all of history. Everybody has always believed that Moses wrote those five books. They're mosaic. Even, I'll just read to you, um, even from in the book of Deuteronomy itself. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Yes, in Deuteronomy it says, And Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi. And when Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So right wow. in the book of Deuteronomy, it says that Moses wrote this. Now, he would have gathered information from the tradition of the patriarchs. And back in those, these people remember things like we do not in the, in the West. I can prove oh, yeah. that. I don't have time today. They remember those things and they keep those stories. And Mo Moses obviously would have drawn from that whole Jewish culture. Jewish people keep the stories of their families. But also he was up on the mountain and it said God revealed all of these things. And when he came down, he wrote them all in a book. 
Now, all through history, when you in the Old Testament, the Old Testament all assumes that Moses wrote those five books. Then you get to Jesus. He calls the Old Testament the law and the prophets, the book of Moses. He said Moses yep. writes over and over again. Paul refers to, sometimes they don't even refer to it as Genesis. or They refer to it as Moses. Moses said this to you. Then you come to the early church, and the Jews always believed that Moses wrote it. And then the, all the early fathers of the church. And it was only about 100 years ago that anybody challenged it. Now, guys like Scott Hahn and uh, John Bergsma and a lot of the new scholars today are going back to the original idea that it is yeah. mosaic. Moses wrote it or it is all from Moses. And then maybe there was an editor that edited it. Yep. Even at the end of Deuteronomy, it talks about Moses' death. He didn't write that part unless it was he wrote it prophetically ahead of time. But my the way I conclude in the book is that the book is mosaic. It was a writing as Moses as the source, and there may have been some editing afterwards, but it was mosaic, and it's important that it's mosaic. And why is it important? Bec and, and by the way, the church tells us, too, that... E no matter what, it's it is the inspired word of God, and it's one yeah. story. I really, no when I go to commentaries, William, that they spend all their time saying, "Now we believe that the Deuteronomists wrote this in the fourth century BC." Oh, and this one, we think the Eloists wrote it. It totally, it totally distracts from the whole story. And it, and and why is it important that we say Moses wrote it? Because the scriptures say that Moses wrote it, and the scriptures are not going to lie to us. It goes back to the credibility. If it says all the way through that Moses is the author and he wasn't, then the book is a lie. And if we can't trust the book in areas where it's verifiable, how do we know we can trust the book in areas that we can't verify? It? Like the fact that there's a heaven or our sins are forgiven. So it's important yeah. that when the Bible says Moses wrote it, we don't make skeptics out of people. Yeah, no, great point that you bring up there. An incredible point as well that it really isn't until about a hundred years back when you run into incredibly liberal scholarship. Yes. That mainly out of Germany. Really... <laughs> it came out yeah. of Germany. And, and, you know, as much as it hurts me to admit that, it is true. You find that, uh, and you know what? I have no shame in naming them. Figures like the late uh, uh, Father Fitzmaier. Then Father Raymond Brown, uh, who they were all out of taps on the Bible and on, you know, the tradition of the church. Yeah. But you bring up a great point there. The fathers are unanimous. Early Jews who would have known very well were unanimous. And we have it right there laid out for us in the Bible as well. You know, I would rather take the testimony of all of those incredible witnesses over liberal scholarship. Bingo. Bingo. If I'm going to err... I'm going to err on the side of the ancients who were closer to the situation and sometimes far more brilliant than the scholars today. I'm going to err on yep. their side, not on the modern liberal scholars today. I agree. Uh, very often, if not all the time, far more brilliant yep. than modern day scholars. Exactly. Now, here is one thing that more and more we're hearing about today. Well, you'll, you'll run into liberals that will say, well, look, you know, the book of Genesis doesn't tell us anything about the creation of the world. You know, that's just allegorical. You're not meant to take it literally. You're not meant to take any of it literally, just kind of like a mythological kind of tale. Right. But what does Genesis tell us about the creation of the world? And are we able to extrapolate anything from the book of Genesis on the creation of the world? The um, kind of the modern view of this, if you just ask a certain people, well, you know, uh, Darwin has come now and we understand evolution and we understand that everything came, that matter and energy has always existed. It's eternal and it's just it's just kind of evolving along and we just are a result of time plus chance plus matter random. And so we don't need those myths anymore, the fairy tales anymore of the Bible. But the reality is, is that man without revelation from God has no clue where he came from, why he's here, mm -hmm. what his purpose is, if he even has a purpose. Because in reality, if there is no God and if the revelation we have from God is, is false, then we are just a collection of atoms and molecules 
with absolutely no purpose in life whatsoever. We're going to die and our molecules are going to be rearranged in the earth and we're going to be gone. And all of it is a sick joke. Yep. It's a really sick joke because I get up in the morning and I think most people do. And I think we have value that there's an importance to me, but it's a lie. If there's no God and this is all the universe is all there. Carl Sagan, the philosopher guy says, and I quote him in my book on Genesis that the cosmos, the physical world is all there ever was, is, or will be. What a sad man, because then you have no meaning or hope. So, Genesis tells us why we're here. It gives us a revelation. So now, it, it, we, I, the way I describe this is there's two books. God has given us two books. One book is nature. He created it. It's like looking at a musical composition of Bach or a painting of Michelangelo or Caravaggio. This book that he wrote in nature cannot contradict the book that he wrote of Revelation. So he's got the two books, nature and revelation, natural um, revelation and special revelation, the Bible. These two books can't contradict each other. Now, scientists study the earth and they find out that there are dinosaurs before and come to the conclusion, I think, rationally, that the earth is very old, that there's a lot of things. And the six day creationists will say, well, God just put those dinosaur bones in the earth to make it look old. Well, what? Come on, why would he do that? Was God, is God not honest? Is he trying to trick us? And the Trinity says, well, let's make it look like it's an old earth, but we'll really do it in six days. And he did that 6,000 years ago or 4,000 roughly. And let's just make it look old. Well, why would God do that? That's kind of deceptive. So the way that Catholics, I think, and even Protestants, too, view uh, the book of Genesis is that it is a symbolic description of how God created. He's communicating to a non-scientific audience. So if you even today, I guarantee, William, if today God said, OK, I'm going to provide you the formula that I used to create the universe, I'm going to. In that formula, it's going to be all about the cre how I created DNA and space and time and black holes and everything else. And I'm going to, nobody would even understand that formula. They would never understand it. It was way, way too complex. So God wrote it in a way that would be easy for simple people to understand. So did God create it in six days? Maybe. But we don't have to believe that. We understand that there has been evolutionary processes, the way you look at the world. So maybe God used, created this over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, things developed. And at a certain point, boom, he puts a soul in this being that's now a human being. And it's now got a soul and it's a rational being. And so on. now Augustine has another view. I like Augustine's view. And I explained yeah. that. He says, God just... Boom, he did it all at once and then explained it in six days to kind of give, help people understand how we, how he did it and what he did. I like the idea. God doesn't need to do it over six days. God could just right. do it and then explain it that way. So the church says that you don't, it doesn't define specifically, but you can believe a six-day creation or you can believe an evolutionary process or you right. can believe Augustine's view that it was all created at once. But what you do, what a Catholic must believe, is that before the creation, there was only God. There was yes. not matter, energy, matter, all these things were not eternal. God created them outside of himself from nothing. So at one moment, there's nothing other than God. And at the next moment, there is something because he created it out of nothing called ex nihilo. The yes. second thing we have to believe is that life began by an act of God tree life, animal life, butterfly life, human life. Life itself came as an act of God. And then the third thing, and there's more, but I'm just, I simplified it in the book to make it easy, is that at, that mankind is a unique creature, the pinnacle of what God created. And God at the moment of conception infuses, a, creates and infuses a human soul 
made in his image that he imparts into that human being at the moment of conception and that life itself, the human life that comes from the soul God gives us is made in his image and it will live forever. So we have to believe that God created everything out of nothing, that he created life and that the, the soul of man is a unique creation by God infused at the moment of conception. Now that really is incredible the way you laid that out because we very often have people saying that to take the days of creation literally would be completely outdated and the church doesn't allow that anymore. But you very clearly show that there are multiple permissible views that one may hold as long as one does not deny the very important tenets that before the beginning there was only God. Yep. And that, as you pointed out, very clearly the Bible lays out that God, of course, created everything from nothing. And yep. as you masterfully pointed out, life, of course, begins by God, by the, an act of God. And, of course, the infusion, the creation of the human soul. Now, that's masterfully laid out as well. I think that was laid out very, very perfectly. As long as one affirms those, very clearly one may take various different views on the creation count of Genesis. Would that be right. correct to say? Yeah, I the think The magisterium so. would allow that. I think so. And, and that the word day does not necessarily mean a 24-hour period. Right. Even in the, even in the book of Genesis, in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the yeah. day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. In other words, he made the heavens and the earth in the day. Yeah. Not the days. So you see, the word day can have different meanings. And <laughs> anyway, the church is not the church is not anti-science. Of course. Not. It's anti-nonsense. Yeah. But it's not anti-science. And so the church, when when science comes along and it shows that this is true of the of the universe, then we say, well, it can't contradict with scripture, and God created it all. So maybe we need to think about how he created it but we but we're the only ones that can say why he created it now i'm going to put you in the spot controversial question what position do you favor well i'm i i have to take a position i think the way the church does it the, that the story of creation is used in symbolic terms okay and because we do know that there that the earth is not a young earth, and, and I know that there's a whole lot of arguments. People would jump down my throat, these uh, <laughs> new earth, young earth people, and they have good arguments and so on. But I, I think in the long run, they're, they're swatting at flies. Um, it's not a topic I've studied a lot, though, William. I have, okay. I have not studied the whole creation evolution debate. What right. I do know is that we as Catholics reject what I would call macro evolution, that right. everything came from mac from evolution, that everything started with space and time and it's always eternal. I believe in a macro evolution that God created and then what he created evolves. Because I can I you can take a red rose and you can over time turn it into a white rose. You right. you can develop types of dogs and cats, but it's not it's not the kind of evolution where everything is comes from sure. nothing. God does it. So that's that would be my position. So you but you would say for those that may be tuning in and, and may say, well, we believe in the literal days of creation, you would say, okay, well, I respect that. That is yeah, uh, what you that. believe in that's permissible. I I I may if we were good friends and and maybe get into a debate about it over the but but they have the perfect free the, there's perfect freedom even in the catholic church to hold to that position nobody right. should be mocked for holding to that position it's a and it's the position that most jews and christians held early on too right before we understood a lot about the universe and the earth yeah what would you if, if anybody were to come to the table and say okay well you know i'm really thrilled about getting this book what would be your overall, I guess, if somebody were asked what the overall message of the book of Genesis, if you could even 
condense that to an overall message, what would that be? Because this is such a massively meaty theological masterpiece. How would you how would you put that down? I I, I just wrote a little paragraph here for myself. God created mm. the whole overview of Genesis would be, I think it's simple. God created man with a free will. In other words, he didn't want to create a robot. Right. Wouldn't it be great to have like a grandson, okay? To, to have my grandson, I push a button and he goes, I love you, grandpa. I love you, grandpa. I love you, grandpa. And I push the button again. Oh, the kid loves me. See, I push, but that's a robot. That's yeah. not a person with a free will. God wants a relationship. God is love. He wants to create us. And so he made us a free will so that he can, in a sense, earn our love, which he bends over backwards to do. And so then he looks at us and we say, I love you, God, because he wants that. He loves us. He wants us to love him, too, and to thank him, by the way. So he made us with free will, with the possibility of screwing it all up. And that he, out of his own free will, created us to share in the joy of his creation, uh, to share in the joy of his existence, even to share the life of the Trinity. And God is a Trinity, and he did not need to create us. See, the Muslim right. God is a solitary God. He doesn't have anyone to love. He doesn't have anyone to communicate with. So you could actually, and the Jehovah's Witnesses and so on, say, same thing. So you could actually say that, that God needed to create us to have somebody to talk to, <laughs> have a relationship with. Yep. But he wants to be known, and he wants to be loved, and he wants to know and love us. And he, because of that, the disobedience that brought bent. I love it what C.S. Lewis said that when, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, that which was straight was now bent. Bent, yep. And earth is now in quarantine because yep. it's got a disease. And until we fix that disease and get that bentness straight again, I love that. So God sets about a plan to fix the bentness, with, which brought marred his perfect creation. That's where we get sin and murder and disease. Yeah. All of these things come as a result of mankind's rebellion against the creator. And it's all bent now. And God, even he's setting out now, he's kind of got this, um, what would I call it? A behind the scenes. He drops it behind enemy lines. When C.S. Lewis says something, yeah. about, he's starting a revolt against the evil that has come in. And even in Genesis 3.15, he tells what the plan is. Yeah. He tells the devil, I'm going to bring hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and your and his, hers. And he is going to crush your head. So yep. he already tells us that. So the overall plan is that God loves us. He tells us why he made us. He wants a relationship. We screwed it up. We punched him in the face and said, we don't want your plan. And that then goes... It, it goes through all humanity because Adam and Eve, we, we come from the loins of them. And in a way, you can see that as um, we have inherited a, a bad gene, in a sense, a, a, yep. a gene of bentness, and that God is going to fix it. And then the rest of the story, we've only talked about the first two or three chapters of Genesis. It's 50 yep. chapters long. We're going to have to do another part here. Wow. And the whole the whole story then is God is telling how he's going to go about doing that. And he calls the man named Abraham, who he says, I'm looking for a man who I can start over with. I can build on this man. And he found Abraham. And then he starts with Abraham and he works with flawed, sinful human beings to yep. fulfill his purposes. He draws straight with crooked lines. That's the overall story of Genesis. Now, you, you masterfully, earlier in the show, you mentioned how the book of Genesis is important, even referenced in the book of Revelation. Yeah. And right now, you talked about Genesis 3 and that hatred for the woman and the child of the woman well very clearly in revelation 12 that comes front and center yep. that, that's that all enmity, that hatred like is right talk, there you talk about that in your book on mary yes well, i do 12, chapter 12 there's no way you can understand it. it even talks about the devil who was the serpent in the garden and, and yep. the woman and the man you've got a man a woman and a snake in the book of revelation and it's right back to genesis so, you know, another thing I, I want to 
say that I do is I love to find the Hebrew words oh. that are significant. For example, yeah. uh, and when the first time words are used, if I can, I, I, we got just like 10 or 15 minutes left, it looks like. So just one of them. Well, we got to do a part two. We're okay. going to have to do a part two. What we've done is we've, we've covered the creation part. We can do yeah. part two doing, you know, the rest of it. Perfect. But in Genesis three, after the fall, it says that Eve is going to, her pain will be increased. So now, first of right. all, that, yeah. that's an interesting phrase because people say there's that that before the fall there was no pain in giving birth, but it says right. in pain you'll do it. It'll be in your childbirth will be increasing your pain. M multiplied, right? Multiplied, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. it's like it's going to be there, but now it's going to be worse, right? Because giving birth to a baby is is it's, it's a it's a big deal, you know. No doubt. Well, and the word is for pain there is isabon now you go to adam and what is his punishment that he is going to toil now oh. the the garden is going to fight him it's going to have thorns and thistles and he's going to toil the word toil is also isabon eve wow. is going to you are going to have isabon in bringing about your children and adam you are going to have isabon while you're working in the fields so their punishment, their penalty, how it affects them in their own realm, the woman with giving birth and the man with going out into tilling the fields, it's both the word Isabon. They both have the same penalty. Now, see, that's significant, I think, when you're studying scripture. To see. And, and in the English, you don't see that. With the woman, it's pain. And with the man, it's toil. But in the Hebrew, it's the same word. Wow. The same thing. So, and and... I'm going to jump ahead if you don't mind, just to. No, definitely, definitely. Because this, I think, will make people realize how fun this book is. Is I always ask myself, when is the first time words are used, like camel or priest or yeah. prophet or prayer or death? It's it's always significant, and I always say this is the first time these words are used. The when do you think the first time the word love is used? You would think, oh, that's Adam and Eve. Just think when God created Eve. And Adam opened his eyes when he woke up and he said, oh, my goodness, look at that woman. <laughs> he composes a poem. Flesh right. and flesh, bone of my bone. This is, she's beautiful. She's going to be called woman. Well, but that's not where the word love is used first. The time the word love, the Holy Spirit reserved the word love in Hebrew for Genesis 22, which is the pinnacle of the whole book of Genesis, by the way. I, I, I spend more time on Genesis 22 where Abraham offers his son. We as, always say that Abraham sacrifices Isaac. He didn't sacrifice them. Right. He offered him. The Jews, they're more precise. This is why I keep going back to Jewish rabbis and commentators. It's called the Akida, the offering Abraham was willing to offer. By the way, when God said, take your son, your only son, and offer him up, it's not a command. In the Hebrew, it's softened. And I, I use Catholic and Jewish scholars to show that. In the Hebrew, that word is softened to mean, in a sense, will you do this for me? Wow. Abra Isaac, take your son, your only son, and I'm requesting that you offer him for me. Which makes it more poignant because Abraham then is saying, not only will I do what you command of me, but I will also do what you wish of me. Wow. So, and I, I document all that in the book. Now, the where's the first time the word love is used? Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Oh, wow. Now, does that sound Incredible. like a in the New Testament? For God yes. so loved the world he gave his only begotten. Only begotten. Wow. So this is the first time the word love is used as of a father loving his only begotten son. Abraham I'm blown away. Son to, when is the second time the word love is used? The servant, Abraham's servant, brings Rebecca back and she sees Isaac in the field and they see each other. And it says Isaac loved Rebecca and took her into his tent and wed her. The second time love is used is of a husband for his bride. Wow. Or in other words, let's say the first time is the, of the father for his only begotten son. The second time the word is of a husband for his bride. 
Jesus for his church. Jesus loves his church. That's the first time the word love is used two times. Do you think that that's by chance or did the Holy Spirit embed that in there for wow. us to discover? I never heard that before. And it was, it just blew me away when I discovered the word love, those two places. That, that truly is amazing. That is incredible. Now, now we've got, a, we still have a few minutes left. I, I do want to touch upon this before we, we do wrap up our part one, because very often I've got people that were, were Catholic before have left the faith or, or really liberal bent individuals that will say, well, look, well, how can you even want to read that book if you've got a father sacrificing his son, essentially yeah, yeah, murdering yeah. him? He's going to murder him. He doesn't, but he's about to murder him. You know, where is the mercy and love of God? How do you reply to that? It's like for us to hear God tell Abraham that it's like scratching your fingernails on his chalkboard. Yeah, right. <laughs> I can't. Yep. But in, in my book, I deal with that quite extensive. I thought a lot about that. For, uh, just a couple of quickies, because I know that we, we have shortage of time and we'll come back and do more. I, I'd be happy to come. When I get back from Israel in October, I'd be happy to sure. schedule it right, now, right away. Um, first of all, Abraham came from a culture of human sacrifice. So we got to right. realize we, we live in the Western world, which abhors human sacrifice. Oh, really? We abort millions of babies yep. we perform human sacrifice every single day in this country not only in abortions but in infanticide and now we're moving towards putting people to death at the end of their life this is human sacrifice so if you think if you look back at that generation and say oh they did human sacrifice that's horrible we do it today we're as pagan as that was so anyway yep. that being said going back to abraham's time in ur you are of the Chaldeans. They had human sacrifice. When, when we were there, we went and saw the death pits. They were graves. When the king died, his whole retinue and family died with him to go on the journey into the afterlife. So yeah. they found tombs where the king and the queen were in the middle. And around them were 80 of his people laid in around him in very strategically, even the horses and the generals of his army. So Abraham came from a culture of human sacrifice. They worshiped Nana, yeah. the God of the moon. Now, I think maybe God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to test you one last time. And by the way, it says that this was the last time Abraham was tested. God never tested Abraham again. And wow. I think God might have been saying, you left Nana, the God of the moon, to follow me. I want to know if you really, really mean it. Are you yep. willing to do for me what you would have done for Nana? Another thing is yep. maybe that God says 2,000 years from now, I'm going to human sacrifice my own son for man. Do you think there's a man on the earth who would be willing to do the same for me? Give his son for me. God is going to have human sacrifice. He's going to sacrifice his own son. For us, we, we say, well, you never should you have somebody, a father sacrifice his son. But what did yep. God do? God sacrificed his son for us. So maybe yep. he's saying, is there a human who would be willing to do the same for me? Also, I think there's another thing is that maybe God did this so that you and I would have an image or a human idea of what it was like for a father to sacrifice his only begotten son so that when God had to do it with Jesus, we yeah. would get a little more of a human feeling for it. Now, that said, and I got more about it in my book, there's a lot of pages on that. But that said, also, Abraham knew he wasn't going to have to kill his son. And God knew he wasn't going to have to kill his son because Abraham said to his servants, the lad and I will go up the mountain to worship God and we will return to you. And Isaac said, yeah. Father, we have the fire and the wood for the sacrifice, but where is the lamb? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide the lamb, my son. And when it was over, Abraham named that mountain Jehovah Yireh, which means at this mountain, the Lord will provide, provide wow. the real sacrifice. Because Abraham, this is something we'll do in the next segment, but Abraham offered his son on the same mountain that Jesus was crucified. So when 
I, when Abraham said, on this mount, it will be provided. What will be provided? 2,000 years later, the real sacrifice will be provided here on this mountain. So, and then wow. the Hebrew says that even that Abraham had so much faith that even if he did have to sacrifice Isaac, he knew that God would raise him from the dead. Now, one last thing. Isaac was probably 15, 20 years old because he is a strong enough young man. Lad is not a boy. It's not an infant. Lad is a young man. And he's carrying the wood of the sacrifice on his back, which is significant. If you're going to have enough wood to burn a ram, it's a lot of wood. And he's carrying that on his back. Now, when Abraham is now at least 115 years old, yep. there's no way he could get that boy up on that altar unless the boy cooperated with him. When oh, I did wow. my movie on Abraham, I did a whole movie. I filmed on location in all these places, even in Iraq. And I built an altar and I put the wood on and I had a real ram. And I tried to throw that ram up on there and it took five of us to get that ram up on the altar. There's no way Abraham could have put Isaac up there unless Isaac was a willing victim, just right. like Jesus was the willing victim when his father offered him. Amazing. Incredible. And before we run out of time, I do have to pick your brain. Where can people find that incredible book? And can you hold it up one more time? Yeah, it's on my website. If you go to catholicconvert.com. Great. Um, we have them on my web store. They're $21 something, I think. And it's the same. They cost the same whether you buy them at Amazon right now or Ignatius Press. If you buy it from my website, you're not going to get it as fast as you do if you order it at Amazon. But you get a signed copy. All of the, my, the ones come yeah. there, signed copies. And it's my grandkids that do the, the shipping and the handling of it all. So you help our family. And they're saving their money these grandkids to go to Ave Maria University and wow. um, Wyoming Catholic University. They're all wonderful Catholic kids that just want to become defenders of the faith. So if you buy it from my website, you get a signed copy and it helps my, our grandkids. They're the ones that make the money. Definitely get it from catholicconvert.com. Brother, you have been incredible as you always are. That's right fun. now after the show, we're going to have to get part two laid out because we're going to have to pick up right where you left off. We barely scratched the surface on this incredible. Yep. Yep. Well, well thank Mother, you, William. You're a great host. I love uh, working with you and uh, we should, we should do a whole lot more of these. I enjoy it without a doubt. And tomorrow, and I got to get you to Israel with me sometime. I'm going to figure out. I'm a way going to go. It. I will definitely somehow, yep. some way, without a doubt, without I'm, a doubt. I'm brother. working on a way to do it. I'm working on a way to do it. So we'll, we'll plan that. But anyway, if anybody wants to go to Israel with us, we go seven times a year. It costs more than other groups, but everything is included. We don't trick people with prices and make yep. them pay a lot when they get there. And uh, we show you the Holy Land the way Catholics should see it. We take seven groups a year, and we're leaving tomorrow with two groups. Incredible. Brother, we're going to get part two laid out right now. I look forward to talking with you again. Thank you very much for your time. And God Thank bless you. you God bless you.